In this video, we're going to have a look at the reactions between the group 17 elements and their halides. And we're going to be looking at these in solutions. So first of all, we need to actually know what these solutions look like. So let's start off with the halogens. Uh, the first one would be aqueous chlorine or chlorine solution. And you can see there it's got a nice kind of pale green color. Secondly, we're going to have a look at bromine solution which has a kind of yellowy orange color. And finally, we're gonna look at iodine solution, which you can see here has a kind of darker brown color. And we're gonna be reacting those solutions with solutions containing halides. And what do we mean by a halide? Well, in, in this video, we're gonna have a look at the potassium halides, which means ionic compounds containing positive potassium ion and a negative ion of a group 17 element. So for example, potassium chloride solution, which is colorless, contains the positive potassium ion bonded to a negative chloride ion. And because this is in solution, if I were to zoom into that solution to a kind of sub microscopic level, I would see potassium ions and chloride ions floating around independently. So when we come to writing equations, or specifically ionic equations for some of these reactions, we're pretty much going to ignore the positive potassium ions because they are going to be floating around in the solution regardless because they don't take place in the reaction. Uh, the second halide solution we're going to look at is potassium bromide. You'll notice that's also colourless. And again, if I were to zoom in and look at the individual ions floating around in that solution, I'd find potassium ions and bromide ions. And finally, we'll take potassium iodide solution. Again, helpfully for us, it's colorless. And if I were to look a little bit closer in that solution, I would find both potassium ions and iodide ions floating around independently. Okay, let's start off then by having a look at the reactions of chlorine solution. So to start with, um, we're gonna take chlorine solution and add it to a potassium chloride solution. And you'll notice that the resulting solution here still has that kind of pale green color. And because we can observe no visible changes there, we can infer that no reaction has taken place. So we can't actually write a reaction equation for that uh, because it doesn't look like anything's happened. And why is that? Well, in this case, I've got uh, chlorine molecules in my solution trying to react with chloride ions or for something to occur between them. And actually, because they both come from the same element, uh, chlorine is not going to displace a chloride. And actually, even if the chlorine did displace the chloride ions, we would still have chlorine and potassium chloride in my solution, which means we'd still have that nice green color. Okay, so a bit more interesting, let's take chlorine solution and add it to potassium bromide solution. And in this case, you can see quite a clear color change. We've now produced that distinctive orange color, which must indicate that we have produced bromine. Oh, that's Br2 in my solution. So what's actually going on here? Let's write a balanced equation for that. And in it, you can see that what's happened is that my chlorine that I've started with on the left there has actually replaced or displaced the bromide ion in the potassium bromide we've ended up forming bromine, hence the orange color of the solution. So what must I also be left with in my solution? Well, I must have formed potassium chloride. So sometimes it's useful to identify only the species in my reaction that have actually kind of changed in some way. We call this an ionic equation. So if I write an ionic equation for this particular reaction, we're gonna ignore the positive potassium ions because actually they are present on the left-hand side with my reactants and also my right-hand side. And remember, because those are ionic compounds, the ions actually dissociate or break apart in solution, in which case we can say that potassium actually hasn't changed, it's done nothing interesting, it's still there floating around. So what's actually happened then? Well, I started with a nice neutral chlorine molecule on the left and a negatively charged bromide ion. And we end up with a nice neutral bromine molecule and we now have chloride ions in my solution. So we can notice here that the nice neutral chlorine molecule 
uh, has actually changed in that both of the atoms in that molecule have gained an electron, hence why on the right hand side chlorine has a negative charge. And the opposite must have happened to the bromide ions. They started off each of those bromide ions with a negative charge. They've ended up forming this nice neutral bromine molecule. So both of those bromide ions must have lost an electron during that process. And what this indicates for us, if chlorine is able to displace a bromide ion, as it just has done, we would say that chlorine is more reactive than bromine. It is going to preferentially steal electrons and gain a negative charge in comparison to the bromine. So let's look at the third example then. Let's add chlorine to potassium iodide. Again, we've got a nice distinctive colour change there to that brown colour, indicating that we've formed iodine. So a balanced equation for that is going to look something like that. And very similar to the second example, what's happened? Well, my chlorine has actually displaced the iodide ion by becoming chloride ions. And that must mean that my iodide ions have actually formed that brown iodine colour on the product side. The ionic equation is going to look very similar to the second one, except we are displacing the iodide ions, not the bromide ions. So again, what's happened here? Chlorine has displaced the iodide ion, so we would say that chlorine is more reactive than iodine. So that's the reactions of aqueous chlorine or chlorine solution. Let's have a look at bromine. So in this case, let's first of all react bromine with potassium chloride. And you can see actually there's, there's no visible change there. That orange colour is still there. It might be a little bit paler because we've added a colourless solution to it. But there is definitely still an orange colour uh, visible. So we can infer from that that no reaction has occurred. Which means I can't actually write uh, a reaction equation because no reaction has happened. So we can stay from, this, from these observations that bromine does not displace the chloride ion indicating that bromine is less reactive than chlorine, which is what we identified in the first set of reactions. Okay, what about if I take bromine and potassium bromide? Well, again, there's no visible change there. And actually thinking about it carefully, I've got bromine and bromide. They both come from the same element, so they are not going to uh, displace each other. So again, we've got no reaction. We can't write a reaction equation and well, bromine won't displace a bromide ion because they both are from the same element. Finally then, what about bromine and potassium iodide? Well, here we can see a visible change. We've got that distinctive brown colour of iodine, so something has obviously happened. Let's see if we can write down a balanced equation for that. Here we go, as we saw on the previous set of reactions. In this case, my bromine has displaced the iodide ion by becoming bromide ions, and therefore we have formed uh, iodine in solution. And sometimes we like to write ionic equations, let's do that. Looks very similar to the previous ones we've seen. Again, we're just ignoring the positive potassium ions, because actually they haven't changed. They were floating around freely in the solution before, and they're fro floating around freely in the solution afterwards. So in this case, we could probably state that bromine has displaced the iodide ion, indicating that bromine is more reactive than iodine. The final set of reactions then is going to be iodine solution. And let's take the first one. Let's take iodine and potassium chloride. Well, it doesn't look like anything's changed. We've still got that brown color in my solution, so no reaction has occurred. We can't write a chemical equation if no reaction has occurred. And we can state that iodine does not displace a chloride ion. Therefore, iodine must be less reactive than chlorine. Second example, iodine and potassium bromide. Again, looks like no reaction has occurred. The iodine does not displace the bromide ion. So iodine must also be less reactive than bromine. And the final one, although there's no need to even do this really, again, we've got iodine and we've got the iodide ion. They're both from the same element. So actually nothing's going to happen. 
uh, and the iodine simply won't displace an iodide ion because they are both species from the same element. Right, now we need to be able to try and explain what we've just identified. So let's do this in the form of a table to keep things nice and clear. Got our three group 17 elements, and from what we observed in our reactions, we would indicate that chlorine is the most reactive, or has the highest reactivity, uh, indicating that it's the best at gaining electrons to become chloride ions. Bromine is somewhere in the middle, and iodine was actually unable to displace any of the other elements. So to explain it, what we need to do is think about the atomic radius, the size of the atoms uh, of each element. There's chlorine, the atomic radius is 100 picometers, bromine's a bit bigger, and iodine's a bit bigger again. So how does this relate to the ability of these elements to try and gain electrons and displace the other halides? Well, starting with chlorine, it's got the smallest atomic radius, and therefore it's going to have the greatest attraction, or electrostatic attraction, between the nucleus of that atom and the valence electrons or nearby electrons that it's trying to gain. Uh, so we could actually state, using some nice scientific terminology, of these three elements, chlorine has the greatest electron affinity. Uh, and what does that mean? What well, just means it's the best at gaining electrons. It's the most likely to gain electrons of those three. And for that reason, it's able to displace or steal electrons from both, both the bromide ion and the iodide ion. Moving down to bromine, well, the atomic radius is a bit bigger. It's a larger atom. And that simply means that my valence electrons are further from the nucleus, so they're going to feel less attraction from the nucleus which means that actually bromine is going to have a lower electron affinity. Again, what does that term really mean? It means it's not particularly good at gaining electrons. And that means that it will displace iodine, sorry, it will displace the iodide ion. It can steal electrons from the iodide ion, but not the chloride ion, as we saw in our previous experiments. And finally, iodine, well, it's got the largest atomic radius, uh, meaning it's going to have the least electrostatic, weakest electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and valence electrons. So we could say it has the lowest electron affinity of these three elements. Uh, again, what does that mean? Well, it's actually the worst at gaining electrons of those three. And for that reason, it can't displace the chloride ion or the bromide ion, uh, which is why in the set of reactions with iodine solution, we saw no visible changes occurring. So let's see if we can just summarize that explanation. Uh, first of all, we've got our group 17 elements, the ones that we looked at were chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And the central point of the explanation is to do with the atomic radius of those elements, which increases as I go down the group. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the electron affinity of those elements decreases down a group. And going a little bit deeper, what is electron affinity actually referring to? Well, it's telling us how easy that atom gains electrons, gains valence electrons. And that specifically is what we're talking about when we say non-metallic character. So in this case, that decreases down the group. Why is that? Well, chlorine is very, very good at gaining electrons. So we'd say it has strong, non-metallic character. And as I'd move down my group, the atoms get bigger. The electrostatic forces of attraction between the nucleus and valence electrons decreases. So they become less and less good at gaining valence electrons. And how does that impact their reactivity? Well, because group 17 elements are ultimately going to gain a valence electron, their ability to do that decreases down the group, so their reactivity decreases down the group. And that's probably about it for those reactions. Hopefully this video was of some help.